Hello friends! Hola amigos! <laughs> Ciao amici! Bonjour les amis! Oi amigos! Whatever your language is, welcome to the first episode of Few by Hope. This is a global Christian initiative putting together Christian ministries of every continent to spread the message of hope. In the next an hour and a half together, we'll hear from 10 amazing speakers all sharing about hope. We also travel across the world together, listening from Francis Shane, Bethany Hamilton, Dallas Jenkins, and many others. We'll also learn from the latest media apps and tools to learn how to help to fuel hope in our own lives and in our ministry. Our global team has been working for months to put together this series of inspiring and exciting webcasts. Let's open our hearts to hear what God might be saying to you and me today. My name is Sarah Brule. I am here in Rome, Italy, and it is my joy to serve you as your MC. Before we get started, we just wanted to let you know that all the information about our future webcast is in our webpage, fuelbyhope.org. Without further ado, to start us off, we have Nick Hall sharing from Minneapolis, Minnesota, USA. Hey, what's up everybody? Nick Hall with Pulse. And I'm excited to share today about, man, why I think it's important that we don't just have hope, but we're a people that share hope. Now, it wasn't that long ago that I was a college kid, and on my campus, there was a lot of things going on, like a lot of awesome things. Like being in college is amazing, right? You don't have to live at home anymore. Some of you do, but that's, you know, never mind. But you get to get out of like, you know, just on your own. It's the first time in a lot of people's lives that they get to make their own decisions. They get to go where they want, do what they want, spend money on what they want. I mean, I even remember all these freshmen getting credit cards, you know, that didn't know what they were doing. And it's like they signed up for a credit card because there was a free teddy bear or some uh, promotional. In fact, I even sold uh, cell phones for a little while. And I came up with this idea that I was gonna put a box in the student union and, uh, and the box was gonna say, register here for a free phone. Now, what the students didn't know is that the phones for me were free. And actually, I got $250 for every phone contract I signed up. And so, everybody was a winner. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that wasn't maybe the most honest thing to do, but I sold a lot of phones and actually there was a freshman girl that ran in her pajamas to the student union crying, saying she had never won anything before. And I just remember signing her up for that two-year contract, feeling like a horrible person. That was the end of my uh, phone selling days. But here's the thing, like when you have something that you want to share, whether it's selling something or talking about something, in our culture, we share good things. So the question is, is this faith we have in Jesus a good thing? You see, a lot of people, maybe they treat it like it's not. They think it's something to keep to yourself. They think it's something to be private with. And I would just say like those people actually don't understand who Jesus is, what the gospel is, what God has offered for us. It says this in 1 John, it says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And that's 1 John 4.10. It says, this is love, that God has showed us love. And none of us, it didn't happen because we did it. It's that he did it. This is amazing. Now, a few verses earlier, it says this. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, here's the message for you and I today. When we have something that is truly good, something that is truly worthy of sharing, and that is specifically this hope of Jesus. Now, hope doesn't disappoint. This is the hope that Jesus purchased for us on the cross. He completed it when he defeated sin, death, depression, anxiety, whatever you're going through. It was defeated when he rose from the grave and he's alive. And today, right now, he is interceding, 
in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. He said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. There is hope upon hope upon hope for those who trust in Jesus. So the question is, do you have that hope? And if the answer is yes, then that is a hope that you need to share. Now, after I got done selling cell phones and getting over the conviction of maybe scamming a freshman who had their credit score ruined for the next several years of their lives because they couldn't pay the $40 a month bill that proceeded from this free phone great deal, I kind of turned my attention to seeing how I could see people know Jesus. Because on my campus, there wasn't just students getting scammed, there was students who were depressed and anxious, getting bullied, getting into depression, self-harm, suicide. Suicide is the third, in some cases, people report even the second leading cause of death in those under 25. This is an emergency situation that people are so lost without hope that they decide that the best solution for them is to end their life. So for us as students, we were praying, I was getting in the Bible, God was changing my heart, he was changing my life, and we felt like we have to do something. So I wrote this paper in my English class called Pulse, and it unleashed a student movement where we said we want to bring the hope of Jesus to everyone. Hundreds of students started to get emboldened with the love of God, to love their friends, to love their classmates. And there were stories of students who were going to commit suicide that didn't because a student showed up on their doorstep just to say, hey, I've been praying for you. I love you. God loves you. Lives were changed. People turned to Jesus. And we're like, man, this is what it's all about. I want to encourage you. God is for you. He's for this generation. He offers you eternal hope, eternal life. Jesus does not disappoint. And God's word is where we get to know Jesus. I want to encourage you to check out yearofthebible.com to learn more about this God, this Savior that offers you hope that lasts. Use the hashtag Year of the Bible. Join this movement as we turn to what is truly hope. Jesus does not disappoint. Jesus is the hope we have worthy of sharing. Thank you for that message, Nick Hall. We went from Rome to the United States, and now we're going to go all the way to Manila in the Philippines to listen from Bishop F. Tendero. He's the General Secretary of the World Evangelical Alliance. This year has been difficult. Sometimes I felt like the world is spinning out of control. We were not prepared for this COVID-19 pandemic. Every day, thousands of people get infected. Every day, thousands of people die. Nothing seems to stop this deadly virus. At the same time, I also feel like the world has come to a stop. We are told to stay at home. Practice physical distancing. Wear masks and wash our hands always. Because it shows that we care for others and we value life. But what has happened? We haven't stopped the virus from spreading. Some people don't take the precautions seriously. The governments have to impose lockdown and we are locked out. Some businesses closed down. Most people lost their jobs. Many schools remain padlocked. We spend most of our time online. I'm tired. Many people are stressed, distressed, and depressed. There are so many uncertainties, and we do not know what the future holds. It can be scary. I am worried and anxious. My heart is heavy. My mind is confused. Where do we turn to? Who do we turn to? The Bible is full of stories of people who live in desperate times. Remember the Hebrews? They lived as slaves in Egypt. The situation was sad. They had no freedom. They were treated cruelly. And when God sent Moses to deliver the Hebrews, the king of Egypt made life more difficult for them. Yet Moses and the Hebrews hoped. They looked forward to the freedom that God promised. They needed hope to carry them through. 
one difficult day at a time. They hoped in God. And the God of hope did not disappoint. How about the time when Goliath, the Philistine giant, challenged the army of Israel day after day? The Bible says that every time Goliath showed up, the Israelite soldiers were terrified and were shaken. They needed hope to help them see that Goliath and the Philistine army are nothing compared to the armies of the living God. And so God sent David to them. And again, the God of hope did not disappoint them. So in desperate times, we can find comfort in the stories of hope in the Bible. We need hope because hope helps us to rely on a power that is greater than any crisis. We need hope because hope gives us strength for today and the biblical hope assures us of a better future. We need to hope in God. Psalm 65 verse 5 says, You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds. O God, our Savior, you are the hope of everyone here on earth. So in this great hour, perhaps the most difficult time in our generation, we always have a choice. Will you choose to live in despair or will you choose to hope? I choose to hope. I choose to hope in God. I encourage you to do so. Choose hope. Choose to hope in God. In desperate times, we can find comfort in the stories of hope in the Bible. We can choose hope, choose to hope in God. Thank you for that, Bishop Afton Darrell. From the Philippines, we're going all the way to Chennai, India, to listen to Pastor Shadik Mohan. He pastors one of the largest churches in India. And also, don't forget to check out in our website, fewbyhope.org, to hear all about our next podcast. We live in this world because of hope. Even during this COVID season, we hope that this virus will somehow disappear just the way it appeared. We hope that the economy will bounce back. Hope is a desire and an expectation for a positive outcome, and we need that for every day of our life. When we look into the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. The Word of God talks about where should we put our hope? Because if we put our hope on the wrong things of life, we will surely be disappointed. Some may trust in horses. Some may trust in chariots. Some may trust in the strength of the arm. But we will trust in the name of the Lord. The psalmist says, I put my hope in you. I put my hope in you. If you put your hope on mortal human beings and on the external temporal things of this world, we are surely to be disappointed. But if we put our hope in this one true living God, our hope will not be disappointed. Our hope will not be disappointed. When the children of Israel were in captivity, God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, never to harm you, to give you hope and a future. The plan of God for your life, this eternal God, is that you would have a great future. That's the reason why Jesus came into this world. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. For the thief, the evil one comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and life in abundance, hope and hope in abundance. So this day, I want you to give me your careful attention because it is on whom do we put this hope? The positive outcome is gonna be ours. 
to come along with me and hear as I go through four important points and let you know that at the end of it, hey, you have hope. If you place this hope in this one true living God, your life is secure, not only for this earth, but in the world to come. Come along with me as I help you with this acrostic of hope. H, number one, H. You have a helper. The moment you receive this God and put your trust and put your hope in this Jesus Christ, He sends His Spirit to come and dwell with us. Jesus said to His disciples, it's good that I go because I'm going to send to you a helper, a comforter. His name is Parakletos, the one who walks alongside you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. That's why we can call on the name of the Lord. In the day of trouble, call unto me and I will answer you. I look up to the hills and I lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh our help? Our help comes from the Lord God who made the heaven and the earth. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He watches over me. He will never fail me because he has come. A helper is given. That's a hope. When we trust this God and put our trust in Him. Secondly, we are not orphans anymore. This help of the Spirit comes and He gives within us the ability to call Him our Father, Abba Father. That means you are no longer orphans. You are no longer lonely. You are not alone. You have a father in heaven. You are not fatherless. That orphanhood, the orphan mentality is gone. That itself is hope. There's enough statistics to prove that fatherlessness is the greatest cause of hopelessness in children. But here is a God who says, I want to be your father. H, helper. O, you're not an orphan. P. Yes, in this world while we live, we have troubles, said Jesus. That's the reality of life. There's nobody on the face of the earth who does not go through troubles. But the Word of God says, patiently persevere. Paul the Apostle says, patiently persevere. Yes, the sufferings of this world are light and momentary compared to the riches and the glory that is to come. Therefore, he says, I press on towards the upward call. I leave what is behind. I leave my past. I press on. If you take the life of Joseph, he was thrown by his own into a pit, sold off to Potiphar's house as a slave, was unnecessarily accused of things that he did not do, landed up in a prison. But the word of God says that the Lord God was with Joseph. He was patiently persevering. Every situation of his life, he just held on to God. And as he patiently persevered, he was brought to the palace in order to become the prime minister of the entire nation of Egypt. Patiently persevere. 2010, I was stuck with a fever. Every day at two o'clock in the afternoon, it would come and it would continue on to 2 a.m. I just hoped that this fever would leave on day three. It continued on to day five. It continued on to two weeks, three weeks. Then it went on to two months and I lost all hope. But I held on to this God and said, God, and the only word that I could hear is that if you would continue to trust me that I am your healer, I will heal you. It took three months, but one final day, the Spirit of God came, touched me, and healed me completely. I was made whole. Sometimes it takes a little longer. Where do you put your trust? Doctors? Medicines? No, no. Th those are human beings. The Word of God says, put your trust in the Lord. H, ye comes as a helper. Oh, you are not an orphan. P, patiently perceive you in this journey. Yes, this journey is filled with difficulty. It is a marathon, it's ups and downs, but patiently persevere. 
a complete. It with an E. At the end of it, you will emerge. You will excel. You will be established. There are several instances through the scriptures that I can take and there are several instances in my own life and own life's journey that I can tell you. If you have this helper, if you put your trust and your hope in this Jesus Christ, you will not be left alone as an orphan because he will be with you. He is someone who comes alongside you as you patiently persevere in life's journey. We will emerge. We will come out successful. The same Jesus who was locked up in a tomb, dead, every hope is lost. The same spirit that lives in Jesus is a spirit that lives within you. He who raised Jesus up will raise you up. You will emerge. You will excel. You will be established. So this day, I want to invite you. Don't put your trust on the mortal human beings or mortal human systems. Trust in the Lord. Hope in the Lord. He will never disappoint you. Close your eyes with me and invite this Jesus into your life. Say, Jesus, come into my life. When you say, Jesus, come into your life, you are actually saying, hope, come into my life. Thank you, helper. Thank you, comforter. Thank you, comforter. Thank you, healer. Thank you, keeper. For we will not be left as orphans. Give us the strength to patiently persevere because our eyes are fixed on you, the author and the perfecter. Because you emerged on the third day, victorious. You rose and you sat at the king, sat at the right hand of the father, the king of kings and the lord of lords. We too will reign with you. We too will emerge. We too will excel. We too will be established. So I pray, oh father, even as we put our hope in you, our life will be life of abundance. Our life will excel, emerge and be established. In Jesus' most precious name, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. We have a helper. We are not orphans. We can patiently persevere and we will emerge like Jesus. Now we're going all the way to Hong Kong to listen from Francis Shang. We're so excited. And I know you'll find this message very inspiring. I don't know about you, but I have never been more excited about the church. Uh, and that may sound strange, but I just feel like it's such an amazing time that we get to live in. I understand there is a lot of pain, a lot of suffering because of lost ones. At the same time, we have to trust the sovereignty of God and also be excited about the hope that he gives to us. I mean, he made us some promises, very strong promises. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Nothing can stop us. And the Bible warned us that there would be times when we would be tested. He says, look, you're going to see a storm is going to come and the person who built his house on the rock is going to stand. And yet the one who built it on the sand, it's going to be swept away. And so I know it sounds awful, but I'm actually excited about uh, that which falls away because it leaves behind what's pure. I mean, this is what our faith is all about, about the day when all the wood, hay and stubble is burned up and only what is pure lasts. This was always his plan and his promise was his church would be strong. It, it, it's like if I had a diamond right now and I hit it with a hammer, like nothing would happen to that diamond. But if it did break, it would prove that that diamond wasn't real. That's the promise that he gives to his church. And we don't have to worry about his church during this time or any time. His church is indestructible. 
but there will be seasons when he, when he basically wipes away everything that is fake, everything that was created by man, and only what is truly of God is going to stand. In fact, Jesus made a promise, and I'm holding on to this promise. In John 15, he says that, that, that he is the vine, we are the branches, and that he cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he trims clean so that it will be even more fruitful. Okay, so the promise is, is there will always be things and people and organizations that will attach themselves and, and call themselves the church, but they won't really bear fruit. And God says, I have to cut those off. It's a good thing. He says, my father is the master. He's the vine dresser. And he has to prune clean the church, the vine, so that it will become even more fruitful. Look, most of us who have studied the scriptures, we read the book of Acts and we see a church there in the beginning that was unstoppable. It was resilient. It was so powerful. It says everyone kept feeling a sense of awe as they cared for one another, loved one another. They, they shared their possessions with one another. They were willing to suffer anything for the sake of the gospel. And some of us look at that and go, gosh, I wish I lived back then. I, I wish I could be a part of a church like that. Now, there are some people who look at the book of Acts and go, well, that can't happen today. Not today, not in Germany. You guys, but we have to have more faith in that. But what I'm more concerned about is that there are people who, it's not that they don't believe that can happen, they don't really want it to happen. Some people are happy with what we've reduced church to, where it's like, oh, that's just a place where you go and you sit through a service for an hour. And that's not what we see in scripture. But some people, that's all you want. You don't really want to be that close to others. You, you don't really want to ever suffer for the sake of the gospel. In fact, during this time of isolation, you've been thrilled because you think, wow, this is even better. I can just watch it on a screen. Now I never even have to leave home. And you just want to dumb down church and this, this amazing uh, uh, church that God, that Jesus promised. But there's other of us who say, no, this is our opportunity. I believe we were made for this. You know, Ephesians 2, 10 says that we were his workmanship. We are his workmanship create, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God determined beforehand that we should walk in them. That's an amazing promise that we can just anchor our hope to. He said, look, I made you for a reason. And there were works that you were supposed to do. And I made you for that. And I determined that before you were even created. That means you and I, as his church, were created for this time. And there's something for us to do. And so while everyone else in the world may be going nuts right now, those of us who trust in him, we have faith. We have hope. We're actually excited about this time because this is our opportunity to take advantage of this time and help the church become what she once was and what she's supposed to be. Yes, we are holding on to the promise from Jesus that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Thank you for reminding us to be anchored in that promise, Francis Shane. We're now going back to the U.S. to hear from Biblica CEO, Jeff Maureen. And again, don't forget to check out our future webcast in fueledbyhope.org. Hey, I'm standing here in the woods of Colorado beautiful August day, <laughs> a little warm, but awesome up here in the mountains. And I'm doing it on purpose because I want to talk to you about hope in blind corners. Behind me is uh, trails that run for miles and miles. It's gorgeous. 
You can rock round, down, up and down through the crevices. But if you're climbing a mountain around here, you never can go straight up. I mean, I can't, maybe, maybe you can. Now you're gonna have to try to find a way to kind of serpentine. So you're taking the hill slowly. But when you do that, you're gonna get to a place where you all of a sudden you've got to make about a 180 turn. You gotta make a hairpin. So if you realize, you know, wait, I wanna get up there, but I'm going here and I'm about to come around over here. I have no idea what's around that next corner. It was up this morning, it was barely light. And you're coming, creeping along, and you kind of wonder, okay, what, what's, what's around that corner? There's cougars out here, there's mountain lions, there's, there's all kind of scary stuff. Here's my point, wherever you are in life, if you're living in this season of time, then you know there's blind corners. You've already, you've already faced a couple of them, and there's more ahead, where you're not sure exactly what's coming next. And you had, you know, you've got a hope, you've got a plan. I hope you're a follower of Jesus. I hope that you know that there's something that God has for you. You might even have it set in your sights. I want to get there, God. I want you to help me accomplish this thing for you and for your purposes. But I'm facing into a blind corner. I have no idea what's coming around that next hairpin turn. And that's why in seasons like this, for hope, we've got to find the hope of God's word. That hope which is solid and secure. Even when, when the path is kind of slippery and you're really not sure what's coming next, you've got to reach grab onto the hope that is solid and secure for the God who's already been around the corner, the God who loves you, who's called you to follow him, and who knows what's around that next corner. I want to bring you into the book of Ephesians just for a minute. I want to remind you of what the apostle Paul was saying to a really young church, a church that was trying to figure out what is next. They are, these are the, this is in the first generation of followers of Jesus. Imagine what they wondered about as the whole world seemed to raid against them. And Paul, who's writing in the, to his, a church in, in Ephesus, writes these words and, and just listen to them. He's, he's praying from, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. And just listen, and just listen to it. Let it just bathe in this room and listen to God's word for you today. Paul describes it, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. I'm praying to tell you that's you, I'm, that's me. That's an inheritance, an invitation to receive something not yet, the not yet in our hands. What's an inheritance? It's something that someone else by their whole life and legacy is left for you and you, it's waiting for you. And in this case, it's what Christ has done for us. It's what he did for us on the cross, what he offers to us today in the blind corners, in the places of unclarity and uncertainty. This inheritance of, in, his, in his holy people, it's us, I just love this, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. What was that power? Let's lean into that. What was that power that could take the one who was killed, crucified for us, dead and buried, gone for days? And yet something, what is that power that raised him from the dead, brought to life? That is for you. That is your part of your inheritance. But go back to the, the blind corner piece and the invitation for what, what is it that we can find as we come around these corners. Listen to what Paul's saying again. He says, I want the eyes of your heart to be enlightened. Now, I'm, I don't have a science background, I'm not, I'm not a doctor, I'm a pastor. I, but I do know this, my, my heart doesn't actually have eyes. But what is Paul saying? He's saying there's something inside of us, in the, in the dark recesses of, of our innermost being, our hearts, that God can enlighten it. He can show us things. Things that, in fact, are, these eyes can't see. He can show us hope. He can show us purposes. I'm thinking of a man I met, remarkable man, in the Middle East. He was a refugee. He was fleeing from a country that he had to literally run as gunships were bombing his house. And now he's in a different country. He's in a foreign place. He has no job. He has no future. And he's telling me this story. It's an incredible journey of how he's survived and a miracle after miracle just to get to a place of safety where he is now. But now he's in a, in a, a one-room shack that he's illegally squatting in and he, doesn't, he can't work legally. And, and, we're, and we're crying together. And he says, no, 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 don't, don't cry. That's the past. He held up a tattered Arabic Bible, which he had the privilege of giving him. He held this up. He said, this is the future. 
this is, that was my life. This is my life. That's a man whose heart was enlightened, the eyes of his heart were seeing something, not from the past, not just at the blind corner, but something that was around that corner that God was holding out for him. Something that we call hope. Solid, secure, clear. My friends, for you, I, I pray in, in this season, in this time of challenge, in this, in this remarkable, crazy season of, of time where God has called you to meet him right at the blind corner. I hope you find this kind of hope. I pray, as Paul did, I pray that the eyes of your heart are enlightened. I pray that you may know the hope for which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance of his people, you, sisters and brothers, my friends in Christ. May this hope, the hope, solid, secure hope of his word be for you this day. That's my prayer. And may it be true. Welcome to Singapore, the heart of Asia. And so today I want you to meet my good friend, Sherman Ng. He's the CEO and founder of Thought Media and Entertainment. And Sherman, it's so good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Andy. It's very good to be here. Much appreciate your time. Wonderful. So there's a lot of news out there. There's a lot of stories. Everyone's having to go online, do everything online. But what does it look like to bring hope through our media in these times of crisis. What are some of the stories that you've been part of? I'm similarly, I'm sure you've heard this many times, but you know, often when Jesus is asked a question, he replies through a story. So I believe that in this unprecedented time where people are stuck at home, people are looking at more, looking more at their devices, it's a great opportunity to share those stories of hope and bring the gospel and bring the hope of God into the hearts of people. Well, tell me more of your story. You've been on a very interesting journey into the media sphere. How did that happen and how's that been going for you? Very quickly, the Lord opened a door and there was a small piece of business that came to me through my spiritual father, mm. one of my spiritual mm. fathers. Mm. We no. managed to get a piece of business done very quickly. Wow. Now, at the same time, I mentioned that I was also looking for um, other sources of income. And one of the things I was trying to do was to produce a film with some friends. It was a Singapore, Philippines, US co-production. Wow, great. So East and West, right? Um, but for over a year, we could not get that film uh, up and ready. The moment the Lord opened the door for me to be back in the marketplace, finish that piece of business with my spiritual father, this film was greenlit. And so we managed to get this film going. And me being a curious person, I basically sat in for script development, pre-production, production, all of that just to learn the business. And then I began to understand and begin to see several gaps that were present. Firstly, in our part of the world. Uh, secondly, in, in how I think good content, good entertainment can be brought to the masses. And so we began that journey of salt media and entertainment in the year 2016. Wow, that's quite some journey and just to really see God's hand upon that. Yes. And we saw that in many ways with the media projects we were doing in Japan and really that was more of a baptism of fire where in 2011 we had the Tohoku triple disasters and suddenly where is God in all of this mm -hmm. and what is going on but to really tell the story that God is here, you are not alone was so important and to just be able to share that in so many ways is meaningful. So that really ignited my interest in media and we've just been able to do that in Japan and increasingly in other languages now 
And it's really interesting seeing the fusion of ministry and business coming together mm -hmm. in Asia. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very dynamic for the future. It creates a lot of possibilities for us, doesn't it? It certainly does. And I think the sacred, so-called sacred secular divide uh, will slowly diminish because I think God is to us one and the same whether you're at work or yeah, home or in church, you know. So I think God is bringing about a movement certainly in that area. Fascinating. So for you then, in the heart of media production and working with creatives, what does good entertainment look like? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, you're asking very good questions, Andy. And our business, we have the producing side of it, we have the distribution side of it, we also have the exhibition side of it. And through the value chain, we've learned that good content is one that really connects with your heart primarily yeah. and draws the best out of you. Amazing. And we've been talking about the East, the West, the different media that's happening now in the age of Netflix. We're seeing people want local languages, they want local content. We're on this drive to digital. So what do you think the future looks like? How can we begin to bridge this and to really see God's kingdom come through media and entertainment into this part of the world. We've got five billion people here, haven't we? I mean, half of them are 25 and under. So people ask me, what does the future look like? I mean, my answer is it's gonna look very Asian and it's gonna look very young. <laughs> the amazing thing is they've all got smartphones. So we've got an unprecedented opportunity to reach them through smartphones today. Now, what are some of the thoughts that you have, you know, on the trajectory moving forward from here? I think in the West, the industry is very, very mature and developed. Mm -hmm. So the, the art of storytelling is at a very, very high level, right? And the stories that they're telling have been very, very good so far. Now in the East, we represent a huge diversity of culture, and that really means that we also represent a huge diversity of stories. Yeah. And as you described, you know, Netflix even are looking for local language and all that, because again, it's back to the issue of connecting to the hearts. Yeah. But what if we could understand that we could learn from the competence of the West yeah. and use that skill and that craft to tell the stories in the East. Yeah. I think that would, would make for number one, very good stories. Number two, very good storytelling. You put the two together, yeah. you have a very good a piece of media content. Well, you bring that together with the best message of all, which is the hope of the gospel and the Holy Spirit is the most creative. So as Christians, we should really be excelling in the creativity and in the media, I believe. Yes. And what would you like to say to young creatives who'll be watching this all around the world? How would you like to encourage them in developing their giftings and moving forward? Well, the first thing is, you know, be carriers of hope. I think that's very important, you know, because there's a lot of darkness around the world, there's a lot of negativity, there's a lot of bad news around the world, and we don't need more of that. You know, we need to stand for righteousness, we need to stand for being the light, not just the salt uh, of the earth. And so the first thing I would say, be carriers of hope. The second thing, if you come across good content, good messages, we cannot continue to be the silent majority. We need to step up, we need to make our voices heard, we need to go out there and, and say, share with your friends, you know, talk about it, you know, profile some of this, this content um, better. Amazing. So here in Asia, we have such diverse cultures and languages and the stories and traditions. But if we can really bring together these in a new way, I think it's really unprecedented the opportunities moving forward here. And so we want to encourage you, be active in sharing the hope you have. All of us, Christ in us, the hope of glory, is because of Jesus. And we want you to know Jesus and to grow in your relationship with him. And every part of our Christian life, whether that's evangelism, discipleship, leadership, can be online through our media today. And so don't be the silent majority, but let's really step up and be active in sharing the good news. It's the best news of all. And let's be in the media space and let's bring a new creativity and ride these opportunities as we go into the future. So thank you so much, Sherman. Thank you, Andy. It's a joy being here. Great to have you. Thank you. You love movies. I love movies. That is the wonder and power of entertainment. But the problems today are, healthy entertainment isn't exactly easy to find. I believe you are what you watch. Science, and some say common sense, tells us that it is true. We are producers and distributors of inspiring, life-affirming entertainment. With streaming being the new norm, we've recently built SMIX, 
our own streaming service to deliver such entertainment right to you. And we've received tremendous feedback so far. If you believe in kingdom values such as faith, hope, love, honour and courage, I invite you to be part of our campaign. With your support, we can continue to build up a library of high-quality, wholesome entertainment. Furthermore, with your support, we are able to produce more of such faith-based titles as well. There is so much creativity within the church, and with you partnering us, we will be able to unlock and nurture a generation of filmmakers to excel for the glory of God's kingdom. Don't be the silent majority, I love that. Salt cannot be seen on food, but when it's present, we can taste it. And when it's absent, we can taste it even more. <laughs> May you and I be the flavor of God to whatever area He's calling us, that being media, business, arts, entertainment, or the church. Now we're going from Singapore all the way to Hawaii <laughs> to listen to our favorite surfer, Bethany Hampton. Aloha, Bethany. So let me tell you about my journey. Oh man, growing up here in Hawaii is pretty special. I had two amazing parents who had migrated to Hawaii in their pursuit and love for the ocean and surfing and a more simple life. They worked really hard to keep us afloat, but they also spent a lot of time with us adventuring and getting us to the beach. And that's where my kind of passion and love for surfing sparked. So as I got older and older, I really dove into my passion for surfing. Sometimes I would go to school with my hair wet and sand on my toes, and I had it like a knack for it. I was really talented and skillful at it, but I also had the drive and determination and I love the competitive aspect. I started competing at a young age and I was kind of the one to be in my age bracket and even in the older age bracket. I would always go against the older girls and sometimes even the boys and um, I was rocking it. I started to really take competitive surfing serious and with the support of my mom and dad we started to travel uh, inner island for the National Scholastic Surfing Association competitive series where I was competing against all the top surfers here in Hawaii and I was only 11, 12 at that age and I was competing against uh, juniors and seniors in high school and making heats and eventually that led to making it to the nationals. So it was clear to say that I was heading on the right path in the right direction with the dream to be one of the best female surfers in the world. I went home that summer kind of on the moon, you know, just feeling that, that movement of pushing towards um, being one of the best. It, and I was determined, but little did I know what was to come. It was that fall on October 31st, um, Halloween, I was surfing with my best friend off the coast of Kauai and it's the most beautiful day you could imagine and that beauty quickly turned into fighting for my life. I lost my arm to a shark and yeah, I think of that day and what I faced and the fact that I made it through it is a miracle. I lost over 60% of my blood and yeah, it was crazy. Um, I had to get to the beach almost a whole mile. Um, my friend's dad brought me to the beach. But it's not so much about the awful moment or the awful day, but the moments to come and the way I approached my future from then on. I woke up in the hospital realizing that my arm was gone and my future was upside down and I didn't know what was possible at that point. And just kind of feeling deflated. But I also had this warm sense of peace that I was thankful to be alive and that God still had me in His hand. And I moved forward with gratitude rather than anger and frustration. I mean, yes, there was a bit of frustration and just that feeling of like, I don't know what's, what's next, but 
I was thankful just to be breathing. And I also had community surrounding me. And one of my first influences during that time was a guy by the name of Mike Coots. He had lost his leg to a shark as well. But he learned how to surf with one leg. And he came into the hospital and talked with me and said, hey, like, I think you can surf with one arm. I was paddling around this morning with, with one arm and practicing popping up and I think it's possible. And all I needed was that little hint of hope to push forward and know that there was something possible for my life and for my future. And I decided right then and there in that hospital that I was gonna get out there and try. I had the willingness to try. I had that kind of theme of like, I don't need easy, I just need possible. And that propelled me forward. I think if we approach life with not needing the easy, because the fact is life's not easy and it's not always perfect and there's always challenge being flung our way. But if we approach life with, I just need possible, we're gonna be able to achieve so much more than we know and dream of. And that's certainly true for me. So less than a month later, I was back out there surfing again, pushing it. I remember popping up on my first, very, my third wave I tried to pop up on. I stood up and rode the wave all the way to the beach and it was one of the best rides of my life. Rather than focusing on what I didn't have, I focused on what I did have. We can all do the same. We can focus on what we do have and what we can do and how we can just adapt through life. You know, there's constantly challenges being thrown our way. And maybe it's not an arm loss, but maybe it's a relationship struggle or a physical difference or health issues. There's so many different things that can kind of be our thing that we need to adopt through. And thankfully, I got out there and tried. And today, I'm a happy mermaid still doing my thing, and I love it. Um, I went on to actually continue competing too. I started competing less than um, six months later and I made the final of my very first surf contest with one arm. And then I continued to compete around the state of Hawaii. And then that next summer, I made the finals of the nationals with one arm. And you know, it's not about the one arm really. It's about how I adapted and chose to look for the good in the situation. And for me, my faith in God was key too. I trusted that God had a promise for my life and a future and to just keep moving forward even though I don't know what my future looks like. From nationals, the following summer I ended up winning. <laughs> and that led me to compete as a professional later on in my teen years. I started competing and traveling all over the world. And you know what, it was a blast, and it was so hard, but there was more to it. It was grindy. The pro circuit is not easy. Everyone's partying, making tough decisions. I was surrounded by people with eating disorders, and these were hard to bear, hard to be around. But I made choices that brought my fo future forward. I chose to uplift myself and make choices that supported my, my talent and my body in the way that it needed. So these compelled me to learn many things that I now want to share with you. The biggest thing, seeking community that was uplifting. You know, I had some friends that were struggling and I still love them, but I sought after people that were going to uplift me. Be coachable. I continued to be coachable and continue learning and growing. I knew my why and I chose my future. I didn't let people around me choose my future. Yes, I listened to their advice or yes, I learned from their mistakes, but I chose my future. I then went on to continue focusing on my nutrition and living a healthy life. When we're healthy, we can go and chase the dreams and things that we love to do. I stayed mentally strong. I love this quote from Gabby Reese. She's a part of my Unstoppable online course. She says, if I flip me, I flip my environment. Sometimes our environment's not always warm and welcoming. Finally, I stayed strong in my faith. Take some time to think about the things that are important to you in your life and how you wanna live out your life. All these things help me to live and continue to live an unstoppable life. When adversity comes our way, 
or tough, unhealthy influences are pressing down on you, you have the ability to overcome and come out stronger and more confident. So I urge you guys to think about the things that bring us down. Become aware of those and say no to them. I said no to drugs and I don't regret that. I look forward to my life every day. I wake up today and now as still a professional surfer, a wife, and a mom. And I, I'm excited to wake up and live my life. I don't have drugs stealing from my beauty and my purpose and my passion and skill. I continue to kind of not think about the limitations that having one arm held, but how can I be the best in the ocean every day? So I would focus on my fitness and push myself in the gym so that that would carry over into the ocean. I didn't let the barriers of one arm hold me back from the skill that I had in the ocean. And I would strengthen my body from head to toe, not only physically, but mentally. I would wake up thinking about how strong I was as a human and how I could let that mental strength carry over into my physical and let that carry over into the ocean. You know, there's so many different negative influences that come our way and one of the greatest ones we face now is social media. If you're scrolling and getting carried away in the negative that you see or comparing yourself to other people, while meanwhile you could be out there living out your own life, Stop having FOMO on everyone else's life, but live your life and be propelled forward. So set your boundaries, you know, there's boundaries that we could all set to propel us forward and keep us moving and working out our dreams and goals. We all face times in our life of negative pressures, unsurety, adversity that can shake us to our core. We can hold tight to our, our identity our whys in life when we surround ourselves with an amazing community and take care of ourselves physically and mentally. When we choose patterns of choices that build our future, we can stand up to the pressures that are thrown at us and we can be strong and confident in ourselves when obstacles come our way and we can live an unstoppable life. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> wasn't that incredibly inspiring? I don't need easy, I just need possible. As I was listening to Bethany's chair, I was stirring up my soul and thinking what are areas in my life that I want to look at from that perspective. Now we're going to listen to Doc Sadell, City Changers Global Leader, Leanna Platz, all the way to South Africa. Are you believing God for something specific? And do you have hope that what you are believing God for will realize in your life? You see, I believe that hope is the fuel that keeps us going every day. Hope for a better life. Hope for a healed body. Hope for an answer to a prayer. Hope for provision. Hope for restored relationships. Hope is to the soul what oxygen is to the body. You and I desperately need hope to keep us alive and to keep us going. There is this beautiful symbiotic relationship between hope and faith. Hope is the expectation, the desire, the picture of what God promises in his word. And the strength of our hope lies in the faithfulness of our God. Faith, on the other hand, is our confidence or our trust in the faithfulness of God, even if we have no visible evidence. I know you all know the beautiful scripture in Hebrews 11, 1, but I want to read it to you again. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. You see, hope energizes our faith. It, it gives a picture to that what we are believing God for. A picture that has all the promise to become a reality because of the faithfulness of God. But hope must be fueled and fed from the right source, from the Word of God. Romans 15, 13 in the Amplified says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing through the experience of your faith that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will abound in hope and overflow with confidence in His promises. You see, it is so crucial for us to keep our hope alive and connected to the right source of hope. The Austrian psychologist and neurologist, Viktor Frankl, who was a survivor of the Holocaust, wrote a book with the title From Death Camp to Existentialism. And in this book, he writes about his experiences in the death camps. And I want to read you a summary of his experiences about hope. For those prisoners in those death camps, it was awful. There were rats, it was freezing weather with much rain. Our fingers and toes froze from the cold and there were the constant beatings from the guards. The only hope for the prisoners, according to Viktor Frankl, was for the Allied forces to come and set them free. And for some unknown reason, that hope became connected with Christmas. The prisoners in one particular camp started to believe that freedom was going to come on Christmas. And so these prisoners clung to life. They struggled with their freezing feet and hands, with their frostbitten bodies. Why? Because they had hope. They were waiting for Christmas. They were waiting for release. And finally, Christmas Day came and went again. There were no allies. There was no release. There was no freedom. And there was no hope fulfilled. Immediately, on the days afterwards, even before the new year came around, people started committing suicide. Pretty soon, people were sleeping through meal times and sleeping through exercise times, and many people were slipping into their deaths. And by New Year, many from this camp had died. Six months later, when the Allied force finally came to bring freedom to this concentration camp, half of the prisoners had died. Most of them died during this Christmas season, after Christmas Day. And many of them had died because of the loss of hope. They had given up too soon. Sadly, so many people on their journey of hope give up on hope too soon. They run out of the strength to keep the picture the expectation they have in their minds alive. Dante was a 14th century Italian poet who wrote the wonderful poem Divine Comedy. This poem consisted of three parts, Inferno, Purgatorio and Paradiso. In Inferno, he tells of his journey to and through hell. In Canto 3, Dante passes through the gate of hell, which bears the inscription saying, Abandon all hope, you who enter here. People who live without hope can be likened to someone 
who is suffocating due to a lack of oxygen. And then thirdly, it is so important to not put your hope in earthly hope, on false hope, on mere positive thinking. It will disappoint you because it has serious limitations. We read the wonderful story of Abraham in Romans 4 verse 18 in the Amplified. It says, In hope, against hope, Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations, as he has been promised by God. Abraham chose to not put his hope in the limitations of his human body to fulfill the promises of God, but to put his hope in the God of hope, who still, to this very day, promises to realize the pictures of hope that you carry in your heart. I want to challenge you today to cling to hope and not to give up on hope too soon. And secondly, to choose to be a prisoner of hope and never to abandon hope. And thirdly, to base your hope on the word of God to choose to look past your natural circumstances and to trust God limitlessly. In ending, I want to remind you of the beautiful promise in Romans 15 verse 13. It says that He will fill you with joy and peace, that you will abound in hope and that you will overflow with confidence in his promises. Go and live in hope. What a challenge we were given to cling on hope and not give up on hope too soon. Thank you for that, Leanna Platt. Now we're going to listen to Nathan Spicer from Christian Vision. Christian Vision, they are introducing millions of people to Jesus every month online. Hi, I'm Nathan Spicer from CV, Christian Vision. And thank you for your time today. It's a privilege to share some thoughts with you around the topic of hope through digital media. Firstly, you can discover more about CV on our website at cvglobal.co or simply follow us on Instagram and Twitter to learn more about our initiatives, impact and our overall contribution to the Great Commission that we're all part of. You know, for years there's been ministries like ours that have seen the incredible opportunities online to reach people with the message of Jesus, and in particular, how effective digital media can be used to engage people who may never walk through the doors of our churches, but that are equally desperate for hope. At CV, we don't have a passion for online technology in itself, and that shows across our history that spans many different media types. But rather, we love people and have a vision to get the message of Jesus to as many people as we can, whatever the most effective means are. History is full of moments that appear to happen overnight. Yet when you look closely, these moments often build over time and occur at a crossover point an alignment of multiple factors. Although a suddenly is often triggered by an unforeseen event that often shocks us all, what occurs in that moment is that the means, in this case technology, meets a need. It disrupts and it accelerates change. If you think about it, nothing new has actually been invented in this COVID season. The same technology and opportunities have existed online for evangelism and discipleship for a while, but in a moment there was a global need and the means made sense. Through COVID-19, it felt like overnight that churches were unable to physically gather and people couldn't socialise, and in that moment, the rug, what was normal, was pulled from under everyone and everything. All the pieces 
were in the air and only a few options remained to continue to do what really mattered. In this moment, we saw mass and wide adoption of online technologies, social platforms, and digital media to deliver a message of good news of Jesus and to encourage people where they were. It's amazing for us that in a moment of time, like a light switch being flicked, what many like CV have spent years advocating was embraced by the masses because all the conditions aligned. So what now? Well, this reminds us that the church has always been in the people business. It has always been and will always be about reaching people. We may gather in various ways to grow in faith, but we go to reach a world desperately in need of good news. At CV, we are committed to continuing to reach people online who are looking for hope, helping Christians to talk to people about Jesus and to resource and equip the church to be increasingly effective in reaching more people. Today, I wanna to let you know how we can help equip and resource you so we can serve each other in this great commission. Here's something to ponder. Before online was fully embraced or services optimized for the online platform, church services were timed events that meant that you had to be in the room. If you missed it, you missed out. Sure, perhaps there were opportunities for a podcast or a service rerun, but the format was focused on those in the room. I'm not totally sure, but experience tells me that most of the effort, focus, and finance was channeled into a Sunday gathering at a physical location. That was a one-off moment that people could attend. Now online has come into focus and it has been proven to be effective, and in many cases, more effective. We've seen digital media and online services now optimized for digital delivery. This presents an incredible opportunity because suddenly your weekly service or gospel presentation has a life beyond that moment. The stories you tell through video, the moments of worship captured, or the conversations had and now created in a way that although streamed at a certain time, has a life beyond that moment. It can be used ongoingly or used by others. At CV, we too produce content for our own evangelistic endeavors. We invest heavily in visually telling powerful stories that non-believers can relate with, that introduces them to Jesus, or that Christians want to share with their friends through evangelism. We, like many churches in this season, are learning so much. How to better engage someone on social media, introduce them to Jesus, and connect them back into local church communities. In fact, we are seeing around 27 million people being introduced to Jesus online each month. The opportunities are global, but they're personal, and at a scale never before available to any of us. We are committed to being open-handed with what we produce and what we learn. Our content and our knowledge, no strings attached. We want to give it away. Gone are the days where the message that we have or the stories need to be contained within the four walls of our buildings or delivered just to those in physical attendance. But instead, digital media enables the message to be set free for all to hear. Through cvglobal.co, you can access all of our content resources for free. We currently have over 30,000 churches signed up using them regularly. You may download our digital resources for use within your own context. We also have free training to upskill others to share what we are learning. We have content from key partners and we'll be proactively sending weekly ideas and content for you to use. I also want to encourage you to think about what you're producing and to consider what it would look like if more of us committed to making our digital resources available for others for free. Perhaps there are churches who don't have media departments or could use what you have made in new and creative ways. Perhaps our media could go further than we ever could. Perhaps these messages of hope, once released, 
could impact more people than you could ever dream or imagine. What if we didn't see information as power like the world does, but rather as empowerment? What if we all committed to sharing um, what we're learning so all of us together get maximum value and uplift from our collective efforts? All this so the message of Jesus can go further than we ever physically could. The church united in using what's in its hand to go into all the world. What if we simply recognise that all of our best ideas, creativity and messages ultimately belong to God anyway? So let's give them away with the mission at the forefront of our minds. Those late night hours spent by your media department this week producing something for the service could have a life beyond this Sunday. Maximum kingdom, kingdom value for the time and finance invested. Let's not carry on our four wall thinking into the online space. Let's collaborate and share like never before so the message of Jesus reaches far and wide. My name is Nathan Spicer and I would love to connect with you. Firstly, to understand how we could perhaps serve you or even collaborate or get your resources to an even larger audience. You can find me on Twitter at Nathan J Spicer or as I mentioned, simply go to cvglobal.co for more information. Everything we give away is free with no strings attached and it's our honour to be part of this great commission serving alongside you. May this season be known as the moment God used to unite the church and to focus each of us on our mission. May we recognise that now, like never before, that the opportunity we have to go into all the world is more accessible than ever. Together, let's use our collective voice, share our digital resources and start a pandemic of hope. Thanks for listening. 27 million people being introduced to Jesus online every month. Praise God. Thank you, Nathan, for encouraging us and blessing us as a church for the unique opportunities we have online. Guys, I am incredibly excited for this next speaker. If you are one of the very few people on the planet who has not yet watched The Chosen, this series about the life of Jesus, Seriously, I don't know what you are waiting for. I have watched every episode more than once and I just could not get enough of it. Here is Dallas Jenkins, the directing of, director of The Chosen, sharing his story. So my story of hope and my story of life change and the story of one of the biggest projects in the world right now actually comes from one of the most devastating moments and failures of my life. That may sound a little strange, um, but let me take you back to a few years ago. So January of 2017 was intended to be and was going to be one of the biggest moments and biggest months of my life. I had been a filmmaker in Hollywood for 10 years, from about 2000 to 2010, and I had had a couple of successful projects. And then I moved to Chicago from Los Angeles to do some movies and projects there. And I had an opportunity to work for a huge church in the Chicago area to make movies and short films and videos for the church. But these movies were intended to be, that we were going to be able to do, were intended to be regular big movies, and we had the resources and the means to do it. And one of the cool things that happened was I did a short film for my church's Christmas Eve service that, long story short, got in the hands of one of the biggest producers in Hollywood, and that person connected with another big production company, and they were interested in doing a faith-based film that I was passionate about that we would film at my church, and we wouldn't have to sacrifice any of the message and they would put up all the money and they would handle all the production. And we just needed to help make the movie where we were here in the Chicago area. And I got a chance to direct. And so even though I had had some success in Hollywood, it was all done independently. 
And it was all done with my own investors and the successes were moderate. And I always wanted to make it in Hollywood. I wanted to be approved of by Hollywood. And finally it happened. I finally got some of the biggest producers in Hollywood, some of the biggest studios in Hollywood, all combined to help me make my movie. And it was a movie that was called The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. And that movie, when we finished it and got the chance to film it and, and get it tested by random audiences, it tested higher than almost any of the movies that these companies had ever been involved in. And the prospects for this movie were extremely high. We had the opportunity to release this movie in theaters around the country and the intentions were, and the plan was, and the goals were, and the expectations were that this movie was going to be successful and launch more movies. And in fact, I made a kind of a verbal agreement with some of these companies that we were going to be doing five movies over the next 10 years. So I was a director with a very bright future. So January 20th, 2017, I won't ever forget that date because it was actually Inauguration Day. And... Um, I remember, of course, it was the day that it was the Friday that my movie was set to launch in theaters and leading up to it, uh, the prospects seemed to be pretty good. And even our lowest projections were still decent because we weren't needing to have it to be a huge success. We just needed to be a moderate success so that we could continue doing the movies. And I remember when we got the numbers in early on Friday. And you can tell right away from the numbers how, what the rest of the weekend is going to be like, what the rest of the next few weeks are going to be like. I mean, you can tell in just a handful of hours if your movie's successful or moderate or not at all successful. And the numbers came in and they were a complete failure. We knew right away that the movie was going to be, for all intents and purposes, a bomb. And in a couple hours, these companies, over the next hours and days informed me that they were essentially pulling out from doing future movies with me and we're going to go back to doing what they did best. And in just a couple hours, I went from being a director with a very bright future to being a director with no future or at best an uncertain future. I was home alone with my wife that day and we were crying and praying and confused because it had seemed so clear that God was involved in this process. It was so clear because so many things had happened that had made this work out so perfectly all the way up until this moment. And it caused us to doubt. It caused us to question whether or not God actually was in this process. And maybe we'd missed the boat all along. And maybe I had done something wrong. And maybe I just didn't understand what God actually wanted for me. And so we were really confused. And so while we were kind of praying and while we split up a little bit, at one point I was in another room and my wife, Amanda, was in her own room. And then she came to me and she said, God just laid it very clearly on my heart, almost as clear as if it had been an audible voice. Uh, two things. One was the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And the other was the phrase, I do impossible math. She's like, I don't know exactly what that means. And who knows, maybe it's not even God telling this to me. Maybe it's just my own thoughts. But I feel very strongly about the feeding of the 5,000 in this phrase. And so we went to the story from the Gospels and we read the story of, of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And we noticed a few things that we had never noticed before, even though we'd heard that story hundreds of times. And one of the main things that we noticed was that the story of the hunger that people had, and when the disciples came to Jesus and told him how hungry they were, it wasn't a surprise to him. In fact, depending on your theology, you can even say that it was actually Jesus' fault. <laughs> he is the one who caused them to be so hungry. He had been speaking for several days, and to the point where he had been speaking over, over and over and, and for such a long time that they didn't have time to break and go get food. And in fact, when the disciples said, we need to send these people home to get food, Jesus said, he really wasn't surprised at all. In fact, he said, if we send them home now, they're actually going to faint along the way. That's how hungry they are. He was actually the cause for the hunger that necessitated the miracle. He got them to a place where the only thing left for them to have their hunger satisfied was a miracle because there was so little food. But here's the other thing that we noticed too. 
was we noticed that when it came time to do the miracle, Jesus still had the disciples do everything that they didn't need him for. He had them go find the food. The boy who provided the loaves and fish, of course, someone had to make that. Someone had to bake those loaves and catch those fish. And so when those loaves and fish were provided, Jesus, of course, could have just waved his hand and not even needed those loaves and fish. He could have just had loaves and fish magically appear in the laps of everyone there. But he still involved the disciples, and he still involved someone's loaves and fish. And then when it came time to multiply it, he then multiplied it, and then he still had the disciples go distribute the loaves and fish. Again, he had them do everything that they didn't need him for, until the only thing that was left was a miracle, the only thing that he could do. And he was the only one who could do it. So we noticed that, and then along with this phrase, I do impossible math, we thought, huh, maybe God is telling us that the box office numbers are going to magically turn around this weekend and we're going to be able to teach some lesson and have some amazing testimony of how God did impossible math and took these numbers that at first seemed to be so small, but then magically, some, you know, miraculously, something happened that multiplied these numbers. But that didn't happen. And in fact, the numbers didn't get better and got even a little bit worse at times. And so that night at four o'clock in the morning, I was up doing what I typically do. My analysis, my post-mortem, as we like to call it, and if you've ever led a business or if you've ever been part of a significant project and something doesn't go right, you feel a sense of responsibility. You want to know and you want to understand what you did wrong and what others did wrong so that you can make sure that it never happens again. And that's what I was doing. And I was writing a 15-page memo about all the things that I had done wrong and analyzing what I had missed. And at four o'clock in the morning, a message pops up on my computer and it's from my Facebook feed. And it's from someone who I've never actually met. We've been Facebook friends for a few years, maybe talked once a year, but overall I'd never met this person and didn't know them very well. Didn't say hi, didn't say hello, didn't say heard about your movie. It just said, remember, your job is not to feed the 5,000. It's only to provide the loaves and fish. And I remember for a second looking around wondering if maybe my computer had been recording what I'd had to say that day because I couldn't figure out how in the world this guy would know to say something like that. And so I then asked, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, why, why, where, you know, where did this come from? And he's on a different time zone. He was in Romania visiting his brother. And so uh, that's why he was up at this time. And I said, that's so bizarre. You know, what led you to, to ask me that or to tell me that? And he said, it wasn't me. God just wanted me to share that with you. <laughs> it's emotionally remembering it now. But in that moment, I remember thinking that my life was never going to be the same. I remember thinking in that moment that who I was up until then was different than who I was going to be after that point. Because that lesson that I needed to learn, I wish I had learned earlier, but now I knew that several things were true. One of them was that moving forward, I was going to let go and going to need to let go of the control that I felt so good at having throughout my life and my career. I felt like I was good at solving problems. I felt like I was good at at getting my projects out to the world and making sure that they were successful. And I felt a sense of responsibility for that, and I felt like that was a good thing. I felt like that was that I could pride myself on being a problem solver. But I realized in that moment that the way that I had been previously was not the way that God wanted me to be. He wanted me to be able to live inside his will and be content with that and to be content with making sure that as long as what I provided to him what, what, what was good and healthy, whatever that may be, small or large, that that's all he wanted from me and that the success or failure of it, as the world deems it, was not up to me. And whether or not he was going to feed the 5,000 was up to him. And I needed to be okay with that. I needed to let go once I provided those loaves and fish. Now, again, of course, I'm still called to provide those loaves and fish. I'm still required to do my part. But the results are up to him. So I was content with that. And so I didn't know what my future held. I just knew that I was willing to do whatever it took to provide what God wanted from me. 
even if it was small. And even if, if it was, even if that didn't involve movies, even if that meant a career change, I was genuinely willing to be okay with that as long as it pleased God. So I decided to pour myself into a short film for my church's Christmas Eve service again. I had this idea for a short film about the birth of Christ from the perspective of the shepherds, looking at the stories of Christ that we know so well, but from a slightly different perspective. And so I did that on my friend's farm here in Illinois, 20 minutes from where I'm talking to you right now. This year, these were very small loaves and very small fish, and it felt like a significant drop from what I'd just been doing, a big Hollywood movie with all these Hollywood producers, and now I'm just doing this for my church. But I was perfectly content with it. Very long story short, I had the idea while I was doing this short film about a multi-season show about the life of Christ, but from different perspectives. And I realized there's never actually been a multi-season show about the life of Christ. There's been movies, there's been miniseries, but there's never been the kind of show where you can take your time and really dig into the stories like I'm doing with this short film right now. But I kind of put it aside because, of course, it was such a massive undertaking. It would cost millions of dollars, and right now I was coming off of a career failure, so clearly no one was really going to be interested in investing in this kind of a project. But that short film ended up getting in the hands of a streaming service. And that streaming service says to me, we want to do your show. We heard about your show idea. We want to do this. And I got really excited. And then they said, we want to raise the money through crowdfunding. And I got really depressed <laughs> because the all-time crowdfunding record was $5.7 million from projects that had big fan bases already and big uh, in, you know, intellectual property where people were already excited about this project. And I was coming off of a career failure and we were starting from scratch. And so I knew that this was very unlikely to work, and I thought crowdfunding rarely works, and it's usually only for small projects, and I need, I think, probably more money than the all-time crowdfunding record. That's going to be pretty ridiculous. But, loaves and fishes. I was in this place where I really had nothing to lose, but I also thought, hey, it's not my job to feed the 5,000, it's only to provide the loaves and fish, and this can be my loaves and fish, and we'll see what happens. Again, long story short. That short film ended up going out on social media and it ended up getting a massive response and it was used as the catalyst, almost like a pilot episode to raise money for this show. And I remember when I was sitting at a computer with my wife and we were looking at the numbers and we realized that we were passing $10 million from over 19,000 people around the world, shattering the all-time crowdfunding record. My wife looked at me and there were tears in her eyes. And she said, I do impossible math. That's what that meant. And just like a lightning bolt, like God had done a year before, when he first shared that phrase with her, it was, she, it was another lightning bolt. And she knew exactly what that meant, that God was laying it on her heart again, right then and there, that this is what he meant by I do impossible math. And we realized that those little loaves and fish from that short film, multiplied so tremendously into this bizarre, unexpected, completely unpredictable shattering of a crowdfund record. And it led us to this show, The Chosen, and season one was totally financed, and season one has now been out for several months. And in more impossible math, we made it completely free to the entire world and have actually quadrupled and quintupled our income because people have been paying it forward after they watch it because they're so passionate about the project. And so now the project has been translated in over 50 languages and it's in every single country in the world and the app has been downloaded well over 6 million times and we're well into our way of financing season two and into we're going to be starting on production shortly on season two. And this has all happened in the span of just two years. So what is the lesson of this story? Does it mean that everything you bring to God is going to be successful as the world deems it? Of course not. My lesson was learned before The Chosen took off. In fact, if The Chosen had bombed financially, I would still be sharing with you the exact same message that I'm sharing with you right now. In fact, I gave this message, I gave kind of some of these lessons that I've learned before The Chosen came out, after Gavin Stone. I was sharing with people the story of how God had changed my heart and changed my life and I didn't know what the future held. And I still don't even as I stand before you today, but I, I didn't know what the future held then and I still had the same message to share, which is joy regardless of happiness, hope regardless of circumstance, being content in wherever God has you as long as you're presenting the loaves and fish to him. 
So the lesson that I wish that I had learned years ago and that I hope that you learn now is to bring your loaves and fish and just make sure that they're as good and healthy as they can be so that when you present them to God, if he accepts them, that's where the transaction ends. If he accepts your loaves and fish and they're good as, and, and good and as healthy as they can be and acceptable to him, then be excited and grateful because the transaction is now complete. The rest is up to him. That's the story of the chosen, and that's my story, and I hope it can also be your story. Wow, isn't that powerful? Bring your loaves and fish, just make sure they are as good as healthy as they can be, and the rest is up to him. As I was listening to Dallas Jenkins sharing, I was just reflecting in my heart, what are the loaves and fish that God is calling you and I to bring? And may we trust that that is enough and the rest is up to Him. To finish off this amazing time together, we will worship together with Isaiah 61 from South Korea.
What a taste of heaven to listen to people worshiping in their own language. Can you imagine how glorious it will be when we are all together before one throne? Friends, that is a wrap for our first episode of Fueled by Hope. I hope you were encouraged and inspired as I was. I have great news though. The next webcast for Fueled by Hope is already September 30th. And we have this great line of speakers like Matthew West, Nick Voodages, Belny Andrews, and many others. You can go to our website, fueledbyhope.org, to get all the latest information and also sign up for a mail list. We also wanted to say a very special thank you to our partners who made this webcast possible, including God TV, Christian Vision, Seven Media, CCB Holdings, and others. You can go to our website to find information about these organizations. That's it for today. God bless you. Dios te bendiga. Dios te benedica. Dios te abençoe. For Fueled by Hope in Rome, Italy, I'm Sarah Brule. May we all be fueled by hope. See you on September 30th. <laughs>